took his third consecutive win despite a trip across the gravel in Spain, the world champion headed a Red Bull 1-2, the second of the season, as Sergio Perez finished second. Pole sitter Charles Leclerc failed to finish as Mercedes showed vastly improved form across the weekend, George Russell finishing third. Welcome everybody to the Grand Prix cap for the Spanish Grand Prix here on the Five Red Lights F1 podcast. I'm your host and my name is Aaron Harper. In this episode, I'll be sharing my thoughts on the race in Barcelona, debating all the major talking points and rating every single driver's performance. Before I do so, I'd very quickly like to point you in the direction of my social media channels at 5 underscore red underscore lights on Twitter and 5 red lights on Instagram, where I post my thoughts on events of the F1 world as they happen. You can also find my personal uh, Twitter account uh, at AaronHarper41. Please like and share this podcast as it would be really beneficial to its growth. And if you can also leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify, if you think uh, my show is worth that, I will give you a shout-out on the next episode. Now then, let's get into the Grand Prix cap for Spain. So in a slight change to the formula for the Grand Prix cap, uh, where I've usually given you the story of the weekend, uh, I have decided to alter this section ahead of the driver ratings and talk about the hot topics in the paddock. So this can be anything from uh, off-track controversies or an incident within the race. And it was pointed out to me, and I had a bit of a discussion with another creator, uh, Matt GP, who I've been collaborating on a few projects with, um, that maybe diving into a few more uh, talking points a bit deeper would be beneficial. And In fairness, he's right, because this was the the founding concept of the five red lights, to talk about five issues uh, from a Formula One weekend. And, uh, well, let's kick off with the race as a whole. Let's look back at the Grand Prix. So Max Verstappen's winning groove takes him to the top of the World Championship. But it didn't look like that at the start for the first half of the race, really, because Leclerc from pole position fended off Verstappen at the start, and he was cruising to victory, especially after Verstappen's trip across the gravel on lap 9. Carlos Sainz had also gone off there on lap 7. I think there was strong gusts of wind uh, that caught the two uh, Toro Rosso former drivers out. Leclerc was in a commanding position, and with both Red Bulls bottled up behind George Russell, who'd now moved up to second, uh, Charles was able to pit when he wanted. He pitted later than everybody else, and then... We'd hardly seen him on the TV screens. He just banged in a fastest lap to remind us that he was there shortly after his pit stop. But on lap 27, that all came to a shuddering halt. His commanding lead became a retirement on lap 27 uh, with what sounded to me like a turbo failure, which left George Russell leading the race ahead of the Red Bull pair. Uh, Russell's uh, Russell's Mercedes teammate, Uh, Lewis Hamilton had started on the mediums, the only driver to do so, but a lap one collision with Kevin Magnussen uh, saw him now fighting back through the field. And before Leclerc's uh, uh, turbo issue, there'd been lots of action because drivers were struggling with the tyres, trying to keep them cool in the scorching temperatures. We saw plenty of overtakes in the midfield. Um, We saw drivers getting really feisty with each other, which was really, really good. But we also had Verstappen trying to pass the Mercedes of Russell for many, many laps. But Russell stood his ground even when the 24-year-old uh, got up the inside into Turn 1. Um, so Red Bull moved the world champion to a three-stop strategy. Now, why did they do this? Verstappen had been hampered massively by a malfunctioning DRS. And this had caught up with him in qualifying as well, where he'd gone for his final lap, but the DRS hadn't opened down the uh, pitch straight. So he ended up backing out of it and not going for that second flying lap which condemned him to second on the grid. And it looked like it was going to bite him again. But the Red Bull team decided to put him on a three-stop strategy to essentially undercut uh, Russell, who stayed out and just ran his own race, really. Mercedes, they didn't flinch about it. They probably knew that they weren't really in the fight for the victory uh, in terms of race pace. And it worked, because... Perez, with fully functioning DRS, managed to get past the Mercedes and he cleared off at one second a lap. He had much fresher tyres, having extended his opening stint uh, almost as long as uh, Charles Leclerc did. And Verstappen eventually emerged from his final stop ahead of George Russell, which gave Red Bull uh, track position in first and second. But crucially, it was Perez in the lead. So from a Red Bull point of view, they were kind of the wrong way round, which... 
you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later. You know, that was fair. Perez had earned that, and Verstappen then had to go and deal with it. But Perez was actually given a message not to fight Verstappen, who took the lead at Turn 4 and never lost it. Perez did collect the fastest lap, and he beat George Russell to third. Um, so it secured a 1-2 for Red Bull, the second of the year, the first having been back in Imola. Uh, George Russell picking up his second Mercedes podium uh, since his switch from Williams. Carlos Sainz, after going off uh, on lap seven, recovered to fourth place, capping off a disappointing day for Ferrari, while Lewis Hamilton recovered to finish fifth. Mercedes would have had a third and fourth without a late issue uh, with a water leak, slowing down both cars as they uh, were at DNF risk, uh, according to the team. The other point scorers were Valtteri Bottas, Esteban Ocon, Lando Norris, Fernando Alonso and Yuki Tsunoda. Verstappen now leads the World Championship by six points, having still won every time he finishes a race with his third win in a row. And another important stat was George Russell retaining his uh, permanence in the top five come the chequered flag on Sunday. Still the only man to finish in the top five at every race. Now, I will talk about the Red Bull uh, team orders thing in a moment, but I'm going to look at Mercedes first because really, really positive for them. Their Friday pace and balance looked much better. The car, it looked just more drivable. It looked more like a racing car because all through this season, it's it's just looked so difficult to drive and just so uncomfortable to be in. It's been bouncing around more violently than any other car. I mean, we've seen the, the Haas and the Ferrari have been porpoising as well, but nothing quite like the Mercedes. I mean, obviously, they're probably pushing the boundaries a little bit more because they're trying to get to the front of the grid and the other teams. Uh, well, Ferrari have had no issue in terms of finding the speed in their car sort of bouncing more elegantly. But f for Mercedes, they've been chasing this performance and trying to make this concept with the, the zero pods work. But all of a sudden in uh, Spain, the bouncing was at a minimum and the car looked vastly more raceable. And this carried through to Saturday, unlike in Miami where they'd seemed on the pace. In fact, they even set the pace in practice two on Friday in Miami. Um, and the car just looked better there's no other way to describe it. It looked faster. It well, it was faster. It looked more compliant. It was quick. And Mercedes also, crucially, showed decent straight line speed. And that's promising too, because if Mercedes can keep this car in the sweet spot and then start to develop it and understand it, they're going to cause some real problems. And for the well, for, for the Spanish Grand Prix, a lot of the, the straight line speed is found in sector one. So you come across the, the start finish line with a good exit from the final corner and you carry that speed down the straight into turns one and two. Russell and Hamilton had strong sector one pace, but they regularly lost time to the Ferrari and the Red Bull over the rest of the lap. So in qualifying, Russell delivered a season best fourth place for uh, Mercedes, Hamilton in sixth. It was a much stronger showing for the Silver Arrows. I know they were six and seven tenths off of pole position but it was a sizzling lap from Charles Leclerc um, so Toto Wolff described it as the best we could have expected and to be honest yeah I mean there was a point where George Russell threatened the front row but I think we were probably all getting a bit carried away with ourselves there but a fourth and sixth in qualifying which became third and fifth in the race and Hamilton fighting through from the back with really really good pace was really encouraging and Mercedes even on the Saturday after qualifying were optimistic for the race considering that they had they felt that they had uh, a car stronger in race trim than it was in qualifying trim. A question I've got noted down here is should Red Bull and Ferrari be worried? I mean I don't think they'll be overly worried just yet because they're probably focusing on each other and it's still very early days so Christian Horner has been bleating on about how he expected Mercedes to get on top of it. But we all know he doesn't want Mercedes involved in this title fight. He doesn't want Lewis Hamilton and George Russell getting involved with his precious Max Verstappen. 
I think he knows. I think he thinks that Max can cover off Charles, but I don't think he's convinced he can he can get the job done against Lewis. And we 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 went through all of that last year, um, and it would be great to sort of revisit it with Hamilton, the underdog. I say the underdog. He's a seven-time world champion, but uh, the man with without expectation and freed a little bit. And there's also the element of George Russell. He's going to want to make a stand, and he did in. Uh, the Spanish Grand Prix with a really good defensive performance but even if Mercedes aren't going to threaten to win the world championship they're going to be an extra element to the title battle and if that element is Mercedes challenging for the championship themselves then fantastic but if it's them just being a thorn in Ferrari and Red Bull's sides that's equally fascinating because those two are going to have to navigate not just each other but a pair of silver cars with nothing to lose um, getting in amongst them. And that's going to be really, really interesting. But crucially for Mercedes, and this is mo mostly for themselves, without the bouncing, the Brackley team can begin to operate their car much more effectively, which can then point them in the right setup and development directions. And that can only be positive for the team and positive for the sport. So I suppose the big talking point coming out of the Grand Prix itself was should Red Bull have used effectively team orders I know they didn't order Perez out of the way but they told him not to fight and that's as good as they arguably had the fastest car on race day I know Toto Wolff said to Lewis Hamilton that he had the fastest car throughout the day at one point but I think Red Bull were just looking after things um, so that probably is a misleading picture Red Bull certainly were faster than Mercedes and they probably had enough pace against the Ferrari but the problem was that they'd got stuck and Leclerc had checked out at the front so I don't think Verstappen would have caught Leclerc had Leclerc kept going. Now obviously when you get into a first and second position you do, I, we've seen this year over the years, you do have a driver who is the lead driver and that's the driver you're backing for a world championship. Of course Verstappen is the defending world champion and for Red Bull he's their guy. He is Mr Red Bull right now. But the problem was Perez had earned his position through strategy and or through running his own strategy and doing the doing the job that he needed to do. When the chance uh, offered itself up to pass George Russell he got the job done immediately with the DRS. Yes, Verstappen's DRS was holding him back, and that's sport. That happens. You just have to deal with it and not rant over the radio. And I know, obviously, the drivers are in the heat of the battle, and we had Lewis Hamilton suggesting to retire the car after the collision early on um, to save the engine. And you know that, that, that for Lewis's point of view, he's probably thinking, "Oh, more bad luck has come my way. This isn't what I'm here to do." drive around at the back and he's thinking big picture but for Verstappen I feel like his frustration levels can just go from 0 to 100 in the blink of an eye and that, that doesn't actually help his driving if you think back to Mexico 2019 when he was given the three place grid drop having taken pole position under yellow flags his race day unraveled pretty quickly he picked up a puncture from uh, Valtteri Bottas and yeah it, it just got away from him. I'd have much preferred to see Verstappen fight for it. Look, I'm not a Verstappen fan, but I appreciate he is a fantastic racing driver. And I always want to see him fight for it. And this was one of my real issues with like the, the Ferrari dominance when it was Schumacher. When Barrichello was ahead, how often did they order Schumacher by? They did it so many times. And... Round six is way too early for team orders. At the risk of sounding hypocritical as a Mercedes fan who has seen Mercedes use team orders regularly with uh, Hamilton and Bottas, um, and I strongly dislike team orders, even when they benefit my favourite drivers. They should only be used in exceptional circumstances so if you think back to 2018 Bottas of course was winning the Russian Grand Prix in Sochi and Hamilton was second with Vettel in third Bottas was way out of the title picture so the the team did the only thing that was 
correct, which was to give Hamilton the position. And rightly or wrongly, it was the right thing to do. But that was like round 15 of the season. And Bottas was clearly out of the championship fight. Look, imagine Verstappen has uh, a run of failures to finish. Or, I mean, even, God forbid, he gets injured and misses races. Perez is going to need to lead the charge. And if Perez is the guy that tries to win the World Championship this year for Ferrari, imagine he loses out by six or seven points. This this day could come back to bite Red Bull in that in that scenario. But of course, Verstappen is currently the guy chasing Leclerc for the championship. And as soon as Leclerc had failed to finish, it was important for Red Bull to maximise the points against Leclerc. And you do that with Verstappen. So from their point of view, Red Bull did the right thing. From a sporting and fans perspective, you want to see every position fought for pretty much all of the time. And I think personally Verstappen would have passed Perez anyway. He had the pace. He had the the better strategy. But Perez had kind of been hung out to dry. They were doing something different and then they did something different again with Verstappen and they were they, they were so divergent that the two had much di- much wildly different paces at, at certain points. I mean when Verstappen was stuck behind Russell we had Perez on the radio asking to move Max out of the way and he was right to ask because he was faster and what's the point in compromising his strategy when you're not convinced that Verstappen could get the job done on his one? Not to say that Verstappen's incapable it just might have been the wrong strategy choice who knows now of course what we think doesn't really matter to Red Bull because at the end of the day they won the race and that's what they're there to do they are there to win the Grand Prix and they won with their lead driver in first and Sergio Perez in second and that's what they aim to do and they collected the fastest lap so they took maximum points in Spain but it just left a bit of a sour taste in the mouth um, because the Grand Prix was holding up nicely and it would have been nice to see them go into battle. And We've seen teammates go into battle before and keep it clean. That's all they needed to tell Sergio. I mean, Checo's a smart cookie. He's been around the block long enough. He'd have known that if Verstappen shows him a wheel, um, he wouldn't have made it that difficult. He'd have made Max, made Max work for it, but... He wouldn't have just jumped out of the way and not not fought his corner. Let me know on Twitter, Instagram, or with a comment uh, on YouTube if you thought Red Bull were right to use team orders. Personally, uh, I don't think they were right. I think it was far too soon. But I can completely see why they did it. So the final two points uh, that I wanted to make were about Lando Norris and Aston Martin. So we'll start with the McLaren driver. He battled on all weekend despite illness. And I, I watched the, the press conference on Friday morning ahead of practice. And I thought then he looks a bit under the weather. He doesn't he, he looks a bit tired and he sounded a bit unwell. He just didn't quite seem his usual bubbly self. And it turns out he's had tonsillitis all weekend, which definitely isn't fun. And even less fun when it's scorching hot and probably a total nightmare when your job is to drive a Formula One car and all of that requires from you. I mean, it's physical enough at the best of times, but when you're feeling run down and not well, that was some effort. And the fact that Lando missed out on um, Q3 because he ran a little bit too wide at the exit of turn 12 and had his lap deleted um, and then still fought through to finish 8th, that's some effort from Lando and that tells you a lot about Lando's fighting spirit Um, just a brilliant performance from him all things considered and one worthy of a massive shout out because you know he could have easily uh, decided I'm too unwell I'm not going to drive him you know we could have seen Oscar Piastri in the car or we could have seen somebody else in the car but Lando fought on and did a fantastic job so well done Lando and the big, big, maybe the biggest talking point of the weekend, um, which kind of went away really, because it didn't 
really work for them was the green bull of Aston Martin and they unveiled a major design update to their car which looked familiar to be honest uh, the MR22 revealed side pods very similar in shape and apparent concept to that of the Red Bull which ended up winning the race and Aston Martin didn't score any points Red Bull uh, well the FIA investigated the issue because they spotted it and they were satisfied that Aston Martin hadn't broken any rules regarding to how the cars were designed but Red Bull have queried this and they want uh, their own internal investigation and the matter is complicated a little bit by Aston's really hard recruitment drive over the last 12 months where they've pinched staff from other teams uh, such as Mercedes and critically here Red Bull Aerodynamicist Dan Fallows was a key member of the Red Bull staff and he now helps design the cars for Lance Stroll and Sebastian Vettel and Red Bull raised their concerns about the transfer of IP, intellectual property, for those who are not sure what that is. Um, but for now, it seems like Aston Martin are in the clear. And the Silverstone team, of course, have previous here, having infamously copied the Mercedes W10 to create what became known as the Pink Mercedes. And for a team that's been struggling to be competitive in 2022, it brings the spotlight directly onto them, rightly or wrongly. And I think from a sponsor's perspective, it's actually really, really good because it gets people looking at that car, which has your brand on it, and it gets your brand in all of the social media pictures. It gets it on the TV coverage, and as so long as so long as the brands themselves don't get burnt by the team potentially being caught out, I think that's a win-win from their point of view. All right then, that is the major talking points from the weekend. Let's dive on into some driver ratings and then uh, obviously you can go and have a look at my Instagram and my Twitter, which uh, I will now be putting up a race weekly table uh, of how each driver is performing. Uh, not with their individual scores from each race, but um, their t season total and their season average. So we can almost track there how uh, the table is shifting and how different results really do affect how a driver is perceived to be performing and of course these are simply my own opinion and my own ratings so of course if you want to do the same then you can and if you want to send them to me then great and we can discuss them and you know we can debate it as uh, um, sensible human beings I think is probably the right way to put that. So let's start with uh, Charles Leclerc because Ferrari were leading the World Championship moving into Spain but next week in the Monaco Grand Prix cap we will be kicking off with Red Bull of course because they are now leading the World Championship. Charles Leclerc, he started first, he failed to finish the race but I'm going to rate his race as a three. He said we cannot afford to let this happen. Speaking about the DNF of course, uh, he had the race fully under control, he had the pace to win easily what a shame because he needed to win that's three in a row that he's been beaten now or he's obviously failed to finish this one so yeah Mon Monaco hasn't been a happy hunting ground maybe 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 he can get the job done uh, this weekend coming in Monte Carlo that would be brilliant for him brilliant for Ferrari It'd be really good for the championship battle as well, especially if Ferrari can fight back from that. His teammate Carlos Sainz started third, finished fourth. I rate him as a two. It was another error. I know Verstappen made the same mistake, but Carlos just making too many errors for my liking. I fear he's already fallen too far back to be a major player in this championship battle. And that's not to say that he can't influence it. He's just not going to be in contention to be world champion, especially with uh, with uh, Mercedes now just seemingly getting back on top of their, their car. Max Verstappen, the world champion, he started from second on the grid and he finished first. He won the race. I rate him as a three. Not his best drive. He was helped around the DRS issue by team strategy and he said the battle with Russell was really cool. What wasn't cool was him just being allowed past Perez with no fight. But I think he just he just didn't quite see him himself and obviously when you're given that license to go and attack with a three-stop strategy, I think all the drivers are capable of it. So 
yeah, it was just, I know he was held back with issues out of his control, but he could have definitely kept a cooler head um, because he was being told just to press the button once and he was saying he was hitting it like 50 times and, you know, that that's a frustration that, you know, if you're accidentally closing the DRS yourself, then, you know, he could have got past quicker. Who knows? So just he just needs to keep a lid on things, really, Max. And then once that composure comes through, he is very, very difficult to beat. Sergio Perez, he finished the race, he started the race at fifth, he finished the race in second. And I'm rating Sergio's performance as a four. He was unhappy about being told not to fight for Stappen. And I think rightly, he wanted some answers. Red Bull gave the usual post-race waffle about strategy and pace or whatever. But Checo had earned his position in that race at least let them duke it out for the victory because they're racing drivers and that's what they're that, that's what they're there to do moving on to mercedes uh lewis hamilton he started sixth he finished fifth i'm going to rate him as a 3.5 he got the fans vote for driver of the day uh and he showed some incredible pace uh to come back through from 19th after his puncture he called his comeback drive amazing um it was a good performance from lewis he I think had that medium start strategy played out, he'd have almost certainly been somewhere in the fight for victory. I don't think he would have won, but there'd have been an outside chance of it, and you know he could have he could have forced Verstappen into a mistake and a flustered Max Verstappen against Lewis Hamilton with everything to gain and nothing to lose. Well, that would have been an interesting uh, debate on track. Let's move on to George Russell, who is still the only driver to finish in the top five at every race. He qualified fourth. He finished third. He's the top performer this weekend with a rating of 4.5. He said after the race, our season starts here. He drove beautifully. He got his elbows out against the Red Bulls. He even led the race shortly after Leclerc dropped out. Still the only driver to finish in the top five at every race, of course. It was just a brilliant statement drive from George because... He he got his elbows out. He defended beautifully. Yes, there was a couple of moments where he moved a little bit late, but he soon tidied that up and tactically deployed his uh, electrical energy, held the Red Bulls back. Red Bull, this is how good George's race was. He forced Red Bull to change their strategy with both drivers. That takes some doing. That is potential world championship material. Well done, George Russell. Lando Norris, uh, he started 11th, finished 8th. I'm going to rate him as a 3. We've already spoken about how he battled illness, which turned out to be tonsillitis. Hard on PA, he described the race as one of the hardest I've ever done. And in, in that heat, I'm not surprised. He said that he'd missed engineering meetings, which had compromised his weekend. So all of that in mind, he's done a brilliant job to even score points this weekend. Daniel Ricciardo started 9th, but finished 12th. I'm going to rate him as a 2. He said it was a struggle. It was just a struggle from the start to finish. I was slow, and simply had less grip than everybody else. Yeah, it was another difficult day for Daniel Ricciardo, and considering Lando's difficulties this weekend, that car maybe could have been a bit higher up the order. So Daniel finishing twelfth is really not a good look. Let's jump to Alfa Romeo. Valtteri Bottas, he started 7th. He finished 6th. I'm going to rate Valtteri as a 3. He said, our pace was strong and it was nice to have some big battles with the big teams ahead. Really, Alfa and Bottas have been nothing short of a revelation this season. And as it stands, uh, after these scores, Bottas is currently my 5th highest performing driver. I didn't think he would be really anywhere near this level of performance this season. The Bottas we saw last year at Mercedes at times looked completely lost and destroyed. But just shows you what a change of scenery and a little bit of confidence can do to a, a sportsman or sportswoman, sportswoman, of course. So, you know, credit to Valtteri. He's not, oh, well, not going to say reinvented himself, but reinvigorated himself and he is driving beautifully. Really, really, really well done, Bottas. His teammate, Zhou Guan Yu, he started 15th but failed to finish. Uh, another driver to succumb to a Ferrari power unit issue. 
I'm going to rate Zhou's performance as a 2. Back-to-back -back DNS for the Chinese driver. He said he was potentially on the way to a good result, but we'll never know. Um, didn't really see much of him in the race, but his uh, qualifying performance was fairly good. He was faster than the Alpha Tauris in qualifying 1, but then I think he'd used his tyres and maybe just didn't get it together in Q2. So ended up behind them. Let's go to Alpine. Uh, Fernando Alonso, he qualified 17th, but he actually started 20th because the team changed his engine pre-race. And he finished 9th. And I'm going to rate Fernando's performance as a 3. He said, the atmosphere was special today and we managed to put on a show. It feels like a bit of a victory. Of course, only Fernando could say that about uh, a ninth place finish, couldn't he? Esteban Ocon, he started 12th and finished 7th. I gave him a 3 as well. I'll sleep well tonight, uh, said Esteban. He was very pleased with his strong race car, adding that 7th was probably the best result we could have hoped for. Let's move on to another French driver, Pierre Gasly, who started 14th and finished 13th. Going to rate him as a 2. He said, I'm extremely disappointed with today. He had damage to the front wing early on, then he collided with Stroll and picked up a 5 second penalty for that, which was completely fair. So, yeah, another really difficult day for Pierre. He's just not gelling with that car. And, you know, if you're only as good as your last race, people are going to very quickly forget about uh, his performances over the last couple of seasons where he thoroughly trounced his teammates and was really you could argue, punching above the weight of Alpha Tauri. Yuki Tsunoda, he started 13th and finished 10th, collecting a single point for Alpha Tauri. I'm going to rate Yuki as a 2.5. Tsunoda said he was quite happy despite not being comfortable in the car all weekend. So if you're not comfortable and you still pick up a point, that's pretty good. And Tsunoda continues to outperform uh, his much more experienced teammate, Pierre Gasly. Let's move to Haas and Kevin Magnussen, who started in the top 10 in 8th, but he finished 17th. I'm going to rate him as a 1.5. Uh, he did collect uh, a puncture from contact with Hamilton on the first lap. Um, that totally derailed his race, really, because there was no fighting back from him, really. He said when the tyres were sort of new, the car was good, but maybe he just struggled with some damage afterwards, which hampered his, his car's performance. Um... As for that incident between Kevin and Lewis, it's a racing incident, isn't it? Um, I've looked at it back, and Hamilton just holds a line, and, and Magnussen is trying to squeeze him to make sure he gets right round him. And it's just it's just one of those. It's just one of those because it's the first lap. Everyone's battling for position, so look no one's at fault it's a racing incident and I think even on a if it was lap 30 maybe you give a little bit more fault to Magnussen but it's not if, if you start handing out five second penalties for that then we've got a problem it's far too over regulated and look we we need it's a fine balance between over regulation and under regulation it seems but look that sort of incident that's that's hard racing that's fine Mick Schumacher, he uh, qualified 10th. Great performance from him in qualifying, but he finished 14th, again missing out on those maiden points. Going to rate Mick's performance as a 2. He said having a clean Friday was very beneficial to car development, to car development and understanding. Lost all of FP3 to that brake fire, um, which is becoming a real issue. Um, as soon as the brakes go, like the brake by wire issue f for Mick, as soon as the brakes go... Um, the rear brakes are just taking a pounding and they're just catching fire because they're so tightly packed. It's, I don't know. It, I'm not one of the technical boffins and if there's any of you out there who know a little bit more about it, then maybe is there anything we could, that could be done about it? But obviously the teams won't want to compromise performance because then they'll be slow. Aston Martin then, the green bull. Uh, so Sebastian Vettel might have felt a little bit more at home, uh, but he wasn't at home in 16th on the grid. He did finish 11th, and I'm going to rate his performance as a 2. He said, we lacked a bit too much pace to be able to attack the points positions. He was one of the only drivers to manage a 2 stop. Uh, would a 3 have helped? Maybe not, but he did add that we are making progress. 
So maybe Aston Martin are going to be climbing up the order a little bit and being regular point scorers again. Lance Stroll, he qualified 17th, finished 15th, rating was a 1.5. The car did feel better, he said, despite losing 30 seconds for car checks after the Gasly collision, but he wasn't really ever challenging to be close to his teammate. Didn't really see much of him, to be honest. And let's finish with Williams, starting with Alexander Albon. He finished. He qualified 18th, and he finished 18th. He's going to rate him as a 2. He said he picked up floor damage after his first stop, which heavily impacted car performance. And Nicholas Latifi uh, qualified nine, uh, started 19th, having qualified slowest. And he finished 16th, uh, rate him as a 2. He struggled with overall pace, but he said he enjoyed chasing Magnussen, who he did pass and beat to the flag. So they are my driver ratings. George Russell is my top performer uh, this week. And let me know, uh, of course, in the usual ways, if uh, you agree, disagree, how would you have rated, who was your top performer, uh, all that stuff. You know what to do. All right, let's rate the race. Uh, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. I mean, it was a really good change because Miami was a bit dull. And I know that was kind of influenced by the the, the rubbish TV direction. Um. And talking of TV direction, the drone cam. Gosh, terrible addition. Please don't bring that back, Formula One. Nice idea, good try. But maybe have it just... I don't know. The problem The problem with it was the fact that it tilts and it, oh, it made you feel like you're on a roller coaster. And Some people don't enjoy that. Some people don't enjoy that. Anyway, the uh, on-track action. Uh, the first half of the race was frantic with action almost everywhere you looked. Uh, I really enjoyed Russell's battle with the Red Bulls. It made a statement in this race for George Russell about how he would compete at the front, which in my view was hard and fair. Um, Leclerc's DNF really sets the title battle on fire, as does the competitiveness of the Mercs. I feel like Red Bulls sucked the enjoyment out of the second half of the race with the team order to Perez. As we covered already later in the season, that's absolutely fine. But please, not at round six. It stinks of Ferrari in Austria 20, uh, 2002, which, you know, that, that was bad. That was really bad. I mean, this wasn't anywhere quite as drastic as that, but still not great. I mean, of course, they're trying to win, but, you know, if, if this ends up with Verstappen running away with it, then uh, just not ideal, really, is it? So let's have a look at how some others rated the race. Uh, the race got a 7 from uh, F1 Grid Talk's Owen Medford. He said the second half didn't live up to the first half of the race. Uh, Tom Downey from Everything F1 also uh, gave the race a 7, saying it exceeded expectations. Uh, also from uh, Formula 1 Grid Talk, uh, Louis Edwards rated it as a 6. He said the first half was great, but the second half was a bit dull. And host of the Monkey Seat podcast and host of... Uh, F1 Firesides on uh, F1 Grid Talk. Tom Horrocks, <laughs> he's got so many titles, that man. Uh, he scored the race at an 8, considering what the track normally offers. It was bloody good, and I have to agree with him. It was a good weekend and a surprisingly exciting race, which was helped by the hot temperatures melting the tyres, uh, which was reminiscent of the early Pirelli tyres in 2011 and 2012, where the teams were regularly making at least two or three stops. Um, perhaps this could be a concept Pirelli bring in the coming years with t with tyres that can be pushed but do wear out and drive a multi-stop strategy because everything's more exciting when there's more pit stops. There's a little bit more jeopardy. You've got to time those pit stops. You've got to get the undercut. You've got to position yourself. You know, do you attack? When do you attack? When do you conserve your tyres? And if you've got a, a, a strategy that's borderline two, three stops, then like we did today. Some might try and eke out the two-stop and get caught out, and some drivers may commit to the three-stop early and be pushing really hard. Um, and it just makes everything much more interesting, because if it's a one-stop or a straightforward two, then you kind of know when everyone's going to stop. And barring someone doing uh, uh, a madness on their tyres and eking out a six or seven tyre, Advance, six or seven lap tyre advantage you're not really going to get that much variation it's down to the DRS and uh, how effective that is for the overtakes and if someone is just flat out faster so the tyres and I know this is a new 
uh, style of tyre, it's a new concept of car, and hopefully we can marry the two together and we can we can have that per almost perfect balance which is very very difficult to find where teams are encouraged to try something brave but also they're encouraged to go all out and just rinse the tires you just want that that balance and it, it won't come at every race but it's something we can certainly work towards too um, in the future and I hope Pirelli can continue to build on sort of that concept that would be really cool for the racing the checkered flag waves on another episode then thank you so much for joining me today if you like the episode leave a like or rate the podcast on Apple or Spotify if you give it five stars I'll give you a shout out in the next episode to say thank you the next episode will be the Monaco Grand Prix cap, which probably won't be as exciting as the race in Spain. But as Murray Walker always said, anything can happen in Formula 1, and it usually does. I've been writing for F1 Chronicle and Inside F2 this weekend, so head to their website to check out my works. Uh, for now, though, enjoy the racing, and I will see you when the fire red lights go out.